Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. It's another beautiful summer day in Alberta, trying to enjoy every one of them because pretty soon winter is coming. Um, the other day I did a video talking about Zoomer magazine and how much I enjoy it. And uh, just by chance I was reading through the back of this one and I found Moses last word, first word. So that refers to Moses Denimer, the person behind Zoomer magazine. And um, in this episode it's talking about something pretty serious and uh, it's related to healthcare in Canada but probably has some relevance to healthcare in almost all the OECD countries because there are lots of boomers in all of the OECD countries and boomers are aging and in decline. So, you know, it looks like a cartoon actually, doesn't it? I mean, it is a cartoon, but it probably should be front page news because here's what he's talking about. He's talking about long-term care. And I'm not gonna spoil the cartoon for you. I'll just give some of the statistics here and you can look them up based on his references as well. Canada in 2022 has 200,000 long-term care beds. That's for people who are elderly and quite ill where they need, you know, a lot of physical assistance and medical assistance. So there's 63,000 more people already on the waiting list. So by 2035, when aging populations are expected to plateau, how many more long-term care beds do you think we'll need? Well, uh, the character of Moses here makes a guess of 100,000, but no, it would be 200,000. And how much would each bed cost to build? The character again guesses 100,000? No, it would cost 320,000 per bed for a total cost of $64 billion, plus $20 billion for retrofitting half the existing beds into a single bed ensuite bathroom standards. So about $84 billion in startup investment, plus $7 billion a year for operating costs, amortization for a total of $13.7 billion annually, and that's from the Parliamentary Budget Officer's report. So on top of that, of course, we would need more nurses and more personal care assistance. But there's a critical shortage of both. To try and attract more people to the profession, you have to pay better. So the question is asked, uh, what would it cost to get the average salary for a nurse up to $80,000 and for a personal caregiver up to $50,000? And uh, so that would be another $6.8 billion per year plus the 13.7 makes the annual cost of about 20.5 billion, which uh, comes up to almost the cost of the Canadian military budget. And that military budget just escalated due to the conflict in Ukraine. So that means there will be even less money in the tax pool because part of it will be dedicated to the military. So, um, why is that something that Friends of Science would talk about? Well, there's another new thing out there that you probably haven't heard about, but you definitely should. It's called Net Zero Healthcare. So uh, most people are probably not aware of this, but the global healthcare community are going to try and cut their emissions in half by 2030. And the global healthcare community is said to have about 5% of global emissions. They want to cut it in half by 2030. And the authors of this study say it seems entirely feasible. <laughs> so based on what I just read you about the needs just for long-term care, that doesn't sound like it makes any sense, does it? So what I find actually quite frightening here is that we have a number of health policy people and doctors commenting on engineering matters where they really have no comprehension of energy issues. Um, for instance, uh, they're claiming that they have a nice big graphic in there and they claim that 
you could do a clean energy transition, go from renewable energy sourcing and low carbon grids, and then they show this uh, hospital with solar panels on the roof and how are they going to run it not just on solar panels of course they are going to put battery power there see it says here use battery power to expand electricity supply from renewable sources and reduce the need for fossil fuel generators well let's just have a look and see what our engineering team has to say about solar and battery power so this is from an article that's posted on our blog that we put up on May the 4th, 2021. And it's talking about solar power. And um, um, it's referring to a Calgary Herald story and taking the example of a rooftop system of the capacity to produce enough electricity over the course of a year to match a consumer's demand. So anyone who lives in Alberta knows that while sunny, skies can be bright and sunny any time of the year, winter days are much shorter than summer ones. The sun is up for less than eight hours in mid-December, but more than 16 in late June and early July. In mid-December, the sun does not rise more than 16 degrees above Calgary's horizon, but in summer it rises to more than 60 degrees. So no matter how cheap or efficient solar panels become, no matter whether they're pointed south or in some other direction, they'll always produce less energy in December and January than in June and July. And when do we have the big surge in hospital demand? Almost always from the months of September to about March, and then the flu season drops off in April. So at the very time when hospital services will be most needed, if we had solar panels on the roof, we would have less power. Now, um, if we assume, just to keep things simple, that the consumer uses a constant 855 kilowatt hours per month, then the rooftop solar panels produce 464 kilowatt hours too much energy in July, and 473 kilowatt hours too little in December. From October to February, solar output is 2,565 kilowatt hours, which is 1,710 kilowatt hours short of the 4,275 kilowatt hours consumed. So if we put a dozen of these homes together, the winter shortfall is 20,520 kilowatt hours or over just over 20 megawatt hours. Now let's assume we want to supply these dozen homes with solar and batteries only. Here's a picture of Transalta's 16 million 20 megawatt hour battery energy storage facility which is being built near Pincher Creek. And according to the Calgary Herald article where the picture was, the project consists of three Tesla lithium-ion battery storage groupings, and it's a little bit smaller than a soccer pitch. So the cost of a battery backup for each home's solar energy system would be 1.3 million, and that would have to be repeated every 10 years, which is the expected battery life. So now imagine one of these for every dozen homes in your neighborhood. So that pretty much puts the boots to that idea, doesn't it? To have, <laughs> to have solar panels operating your hospital. Um, you see, people just are not aware of the complexities of the power grip, and yet we have these uh, very influential groups of doctors and uh, medical policy providers calling for exactly this. They're calling for renewables, they're calling for sourcing of renewable power. They also are recommending things like that people should um, get to the clinic in uh, less carbon intensive ways, like maybe bike to the hospital or the clinic or walk, take active transport, you know, one of those little e-scooters, which I understand is the cause of many broken jaws and broken bones these days. This is how they're recommending that people should have net zero health care and get to the hospital.
But an even more concerning aspect of this conflating of climate change and medical care is that um, there's quite a bit of evidence now, especially with the change in the medical assistance in dying legislation, made legislation, or for those not in Canada, it's euthanasia. There's quite a bit of evidence that people are now being recommended the route of made rather than being treated for what ails them. In fact, people who suffered loneliness during the lockdowns. There was a woman who was 90, very healthy, and even during the first lockdown, she exercised all the time in her tiny room and took it in stride and, you know, we were gonna get through this, everything would be all right. But before the next lockdown, she said, no, I don't wanna live that way. She requested medical assistance in dying, euthanasia, and was granted it. And her family was happy for her. So um, you can imagine people who don't have supportive families or have no one, people who have very complex health issues, uh, people who have complex mental health issues, people who are disabled and have extremely narrow uh, sums of money. When they're suffering, instead of being treated, helped, supported, uh, provided with social assistance of some kind. People are now recommending to them they should consider MAID. Now, unfortunately, this parallels what happened in the Weimar Republic of Germany, which was before the Nazis took power. And it was public policy then to get rid of useless eaters. They actually would come to your house, pick you up in a van, take you to a facility, check you out, walk you into a room, gas you with carbon monoxide, and then report back to the family that unfortunately you died uh, during treatment or care. Uh, and hundreds of thousands of people were wiped out this way long before the Holocaust. And that's not to make light of what happened in the Holocaust or to detract from that horrible genocide. But this was public policy in Weimar, Germany. It's called democide, when the government is actively killing people. So I would like to suggest that people read some books about the healthcare situation in Canada. One of them is Patients at Risk. This is by Susan Martinuk. I don't know her, but it's a great book. It shows you that universal healthcare uh, was never feasible in Canada to begin with and basically people are being rationed care um, in very inappropriate ways and many of them are suffering. Many people miss their treatments during the COVID lockdowns and some of those people are in pain and probably their only option for treatment will be made. Um, there's also a list of doctors by specialty across Canada and, uh, you know, although people often say, well, why don't we have a system like Germany or, you know, why don't we copy the system in Denmark or whatever European country seems to have more success than us. And I'm not discounting that there might be some things that we could do. Um, you can see, you know, we have a very big country and the types of doctors are not evenly distributed across the country. So if you need a particular kind of care and you happen to be in one of the bigger provinces or urban centers like in BC, in Vancouver, Lower Mainland, Alberta, in Ontario, um, you more likely will be able to find that kind of specialist care. But if you're in the rest of the country, you won't be able to. You'll have to travel if, if that's provided for. And there's probably going to already be a lineup in another province. In fact, Saskatchewan has started sending some of their um, orthopedic surgeries to Alberta, 20 a month, I think. But as uh, a doctor noted on Twitter the other day, there's tens of thousands of people lined up for that kind of care. So 20 a month, it's better than nothing for those 20, but it's really a drop in the bucket. Um, 
I read Dark Age Ahead some time ago. I haven't read it recently by Jane Jacobs, but I think that uh, that is what we're facing. We're facing a very dark age ahead. And um, these climate change fanatics are imposing ridiculous, expensive, ineffective, unreliable uh, energy policies on us. And one thing that medicine really needs is it needs a lot of energy. Modern med medicine completely relies on electricity for proper care. So, um, you know, they're destroying the basis of good care. So I think um, this is now a personal comment of mine. Maybe people should read 12 Weeks in Spring by June Colwood. And it's a story of a woman who had an incurable condition and who decided not to go the hospital route and to simply die at home. And with the help of her uh, church community, people volunteered to be there to help her as her personal care aides as she declined, and she declined rather rapidly. So uh, it may offer some ideas for how we can cope going forward, because uh, if you have loved ones who need care, they probably won't get it, unless if you're very well to do, you might be able to buy it, but that's not most of Canadians. And most Canadians are on fixed pensions. They don't have a lot of spare money. And with what's happening now, in terms of inflation, they won't have the means to find themselves a nice care facility either. So we're facing very, very difficult times. And I think it's imperative that we get the medical community back to taking care of medicine and your medical needs instead of fiddling around trying to save the planet. They should be trying to save people or at least offer them the type of compassionate care that a person needs as they get older and as they reach the end of their life and uh, not running around trying to put solar panels on the hospital and batteries beside it. I mean, it's ludicrous. I'll, uh, I think you should also read our report, Burning Questions, which was about coal phase out in Alberta, because in that one we also studied quite a bit about medical issues and medical needs, and the needs of a hospital in terms of electricity are enormous, you know, and to cut, to try and cut greenhouse gases in health, in health care in half by 2030 is simply a ludicrous plan and I would even say a murderous plan. It's not doable. And part of the reason is that many of the things in a hospital, a lot of the equipment there, has to run 24-7 uh, because it's, um, you know, very uh, minutely, precisely calibrated for whatever that purpose is, like a, a CT scanner, a MRI, x-ray machine, um, heart pump. Some of these things, you just can't turn them off and on because they have to uh, be calibrated and uh, the recalibration process is very complex. So um, I guess if you're trying to cut emissions in half by 2030, the easiest way is to stop treating people, half the people, by 2030. And you can see that in the UK during COVID lockdowns, many elderly people were given uh, midazolam, which is a respiratory repressant, and many of them died from it. And uh, they did not need that prescription, but they were sacrificed for the greater good. So conflating climate and healthcare is a very dangerous, ugly path, and we're on it. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling.